Is it motivation or discipline? What, to do something? To do something. Discipline. Why? Because you can be motivated, but motivation doesn't get it, get it done. And you, how, if you always rely on motivation to get something done, then you always consistently got to try and either find something that motivates you or have someone that motivates you. Welcome to another podcast of the I Love Monday podcast. Today we have the founder of Join the 5am Club and the managing partner of 5D Capital Partners, D Ludlow. Thanks, I appreciate um, the invitation. Um, what is Join the 5am Club? So, in lockdown, um, when everyone got locked in their houses, uh, I got a little bit bored. And so I contacted a few of my friends and said, look, let's get some accountability because you I don't know, I don't know about you, but I started finding myself waking up a bit later, just eating rubbish food, just not doing a lot because he was like, just stay in the house. Um, so I gathered a few of my friends, said, let's get some accountability. Let's wake up at five. Let's just see if we can help each other. Some people's businesses were shut down, some were online. So, you know, see if we could help. And then because of social media, you know, you start sharing what you're doing. People are like, I'm up at 5 a.m. It just started to be a bit of a, it just, spread massively more people join the calls and it become really hard to just have open conversation because there's like 20 30 people on the call so we started to see people in the group if they wanted to speak like, like do you, what do you do so we had one guy that wanted to he, he sort of taught nlp neuro linguistic programming so he did a, a presentation on it and then basically from there um more people did it and it just it grew like an ecosystem and so now i see it as a the barrier to entry for like entrepreneurship because you can go into the 5am club portal and there's stuff in there from it's very property based so like 70 75 percent property all the different strategies but then you've got like general business marketing um crypto stocks pretty much covers everything so it's a good place for people to jump into sort of entrepreneurship if they want to see and like test the water with different things they like um, that's why I see it as now, but it was a complete accident. <laughs> Is that how, why you, now you get like experts to speak, or experts to speak about whatever their uh, trade is in, basically? Yeah, so it grew from there to more people was involved, so we monetized it. It started to take a lot of time, but when everything opened back up, it was hard for me to commit to it, so I had to hire somebody else and other people to, you know, do a lot of the back end stuff. So we um, not that the speakers weren't good before, but it's more of a case if now we we identify speakers we feel could give really good value to people and then we bring them on and it's a good place for people to meet them um, and also you know a lot of people in the network has actually they've jv'd together or even we have one guy um my friend adam um he actually bought a car from someone else in the group that was oh, a right. car salesman and just stuff you know it, it become really good network of people we've done a lot of charity stuff um so yeah it's just a nice community now no, that's quite good. Um, especially we started accidentally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, tell us about your journey. How did you begin? Uh, where did you get your business spirit from? Um, so my dad was, he had his own business, he was an IFA. Um, and when I was either 14 or 15, I can't remember, he took me to a rich dad, poor dad seminar. Now, obviously growing up, um, I seen him in business anyway. And... Um, he took me to the seminar, and this was back when you had like no redemption mortgages, credit card deposits. It was crazy. It was like the wild, looking back, it was the wild west, but this is pre-2008. Um, and I just thought, this is amazing, but because of my age, I was like, this is something I'm going to go into do down the line. So that opened my mind, reading the book. He always used to give me books to read and stuff, but I was probably around the wrong people when I was younger. And... Um, I didn't really take it serious. So then when I left school, I was like, what do I, so, sorry, the year before I left school, in the six weeks holidays, I was already like, I used to wash cars on a Saturday and Sunday, and then I'd like wash dishes in a restaurant on a Tuesday and Thursday in the same week, because basically I wanted to save for my first car. I thought as soon as I passed my test, I need, need a car. And um, it literally, Left school, but the year before, the, the, sorry, the summer holidays before I left school, we started this like gardening business. And me, my, me and my friend we was going around old people's houses and was like, look, to earn extra money, we'll cut your lawn, do your hedge. And I start, we did one job where we had to dig out um, like a tree stump. 
and we, it took two days and they paid us 150 pounds. Now when you're like 15, I was like, well, this, you can actually earn good money if you just do this for yourself and you're hungry. And then what I realized was we did that, um, we finished the morning of the day after. I'm like, we got like a whole another side of the day, we can go and earn more money. So I was really inspired then by doing that because I tried a few things when I first left school where like sales stuff and but I didn't really click with anything and it wasn't that I was probably slightly unteachable at the time and my ego was slightly big I think at the time and I was like I, I don't want to do it do it like this and again I was also outside of that I was around the wrong people so it was a bit of a bad mix and then um, yeah from there I went and worked for my dad for a little bit and I started studying the CMAP to do um, yeah. mortgages and I just didn't have the patience. And I was like, because the reason what, what was, I went to um, one, a meeting with him and his friends, and he said, oh, he said, oh, D studying for the CMAP. And they went, oh, well, you have to wait till you get here on your face for people to take you serious. Because I was like 16 and a half, 17. And straight away, I was like, I'm not waiting until that. You know, I, you know, 25, 26 years old, probably. I'm like, I can't wait that long to be taken serious. So that just put me off. And I just went and done my own thing. I went through multiple startups, different ideas, and some did pretty good, some didn't. What was the first idea you had after that? Um, my first idea was a meal prep company. I didn't do that first though. Um, actually, we bought a supplement shop. So um, me, and my, me and my friend, he had a gym, he started a gym, and then we bought a load of stock from a supplement shop and just everything that they did, and we put it in his gym. So that was the first thing, and I thought, well, we can, it was like 50% margins. I was like, this is, we're gonna make good money doing this. But back then again, inexperience, lack of business acumen, not realizing like, you know, we're relying at the time, there was like no Facebook ads, you know, um, we're relying on the footfall of the gym. So yeah. that's all, the only people we can really sell to is members. And at the time there wasn't a lot of members. So it's not that we didn't make money, we didn't make enough to, you know, no, no lifestyle come of it, put it that way. Um, so that didn't really go anywhere. Um, I invested in his gym, um, and then the, the meal prep um, business come later on. Um, but yeah, there was we had barber shops because my brother's in that industry, so we had a couple of barber shops. And we actually was going down the franchise model of the barber shops. We spoke to a company down here actually that told us what we needed to do to be able to roll out a franchise model. So that was something that we were really um, focused on at the time, and um, you know we'd look at. The only thing is to look to expand. We have to identify a location, whether we're going to set one up or buy one that already existed. I would quite quickly work out the ceiling for their location. So I'd be like, how many chairs can we fit in there? Um, how many barbers can we get on rotation within the opening hours? What can we price our services at? And then I work out how many of those services we could get to at the worst case scenario in their opening hours, work out the ceiling. Like, right now, we our job to fill the chairs. And then once we hit the ceiling, we need to look at the next one. Um, but that was a very hard industry to crack, um, to scale in, because it's such a low barrier to entry to open your own shop. You know, once you become, once the barber knows they're good, they know they've got a custom yeah. base and people will wait for them. They're like, well, for a couple of grand, I can just go and open my own shop. That become hard. So um, we got offered an exit before we even did the franchise model. And I just, I, I was down for it straight away. I'm like, I'm out. I had other things going on at the time too, um, other business interests, and my brother got offered an opportunity overseas, so it just all made sense. But yeah, a lot of my business acumen come from one, um, a lot of reading, and but I'm a, I learn through experience, and um, mine come from a lot of mistakes, realizing the wrong way to do, to do it. What kind of mistakes taught you probably the best thing? Joint ventures. Never do it. No, never do it. Do as much due diligence as you possibly can before you go into a joint venture because you make decisions when everybody's optimistic, everyone's, you've got the momentum. So, yeah. you know, you're having a good conversation and you, all these great ideas are coming out and you never think of what could happen if it goes wrong. So, you, I didn't sign shareholder agreements because um, you think I'm never going to fall out with this person. And then, yeah. when, but when money's involved, and, th and big decisions need to be made, you start to realize that, you know, we could have alleviated all, this, all these problems at the start because if we agreed that these are our shareholder responsibilities and if X happens, 
this happens and you could just map it all out at the start while the momentum's there and everyone's happy. So um, when a problem comes up, you're like, this, you know, this is what we agreed. So that was, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. And the, the crazy thing is I did made that mistake three times. Th this is crazy. Like now, I'm, I would never do that, you know, but back then I, I thought I was just young and hungry and I just, I don't know, I didn't... How, how did you repeatedly make the mistake? I just didn't get mainly shareholder agreements because when money's involved or when things go wrong, that's when the problems arise. Yeah. So three times I went into a joint venture and didn't sign a shareholder agreement, which is absolutely crazy. Yeah. It's that saying that said you don't make a decision when you're happy and don't make a decision when you're angry. Yeah. Because um, obviously that clouds your judgment. Yeah, and, and so one of the things that I live by is before you make a judgment call or you make a decision on something that's important, give it 24 hours. I always think that because you feel completely different after 24 yeah. hours. Um, so yeah, back then though, I was just young, hungry, wanted to take on the world, wanted to build an empire. I had so many ideas. Me and my high school friend, Luke, we wanted, we was like, right, we're gonna get a limousine business, we're gonna have a construction business. But it was all these ideas and we wanted this brand that we decided we was gonna run with on everything. And yeah. <laughs> I had that, I remember when I was, writing like my first kind of business plan and it was actually rent to rent um, and it was you know what this is going to provide me cash flow so I can do another 10 businesses here and then all of a sudden you're running three businesses at the same time it's like it's not straightforward no. having 10 uh, it requires a certain skill set I would say and also people you know yeah. to become a a lot of people I think there's a few misconceptions about leadership people think the lead is the one pointing and to do this do this and bossing people around but is is i i don't see a leader as that person you know that's um, for me if you need a ceo that focuses predominantly on you know ceos are meant to know right what are we tackling right now you know, who needs to do which role who's the best at what, what what's the strategy but i think a leader sits behind they, they obviously need leadership abilities as a ceo or md or even a general manager but a leader i think a leader is someone who's happy to put others on the scoreboard yeah. and I think that when you're building something and you don't have the right people, it's hard to scale because people allow you to scale. Yeah. And that's a complete different animal in itself is managing people and building a culture inside a business. I think, yeah, that's a different skill set again. What kind of leader would you say you are? Before, I'm, a, I'm very much a driver. So I, I'm, I'm happy to make decisions. I love strategy. Um, and so I, I think I'm, I, my personality is definitely someone who's a driver to make decisions and lead the pack. Along with managing people, do you, when you're recruiting, how do you get that right? Because that's probably more difficult than yeah. managing the people because you get the wrong person and you're stuck for another two, three months. So when you manage people, uh, sorry, when you recruit, this is, that's, this is a period down to a judgment call. Yes, you can look at the historical data Yes, you can get a vibe from the person, you can ask certain questions, you can dive into further questions. But I think a job interview is like someone's first date. Like no one turns up and really shows the real them. They always, yeah. is a fabricated version of yourself or an enhanced version of yourself. Because, you know, that's just what you do, right? And um, so I think it's hard to, you do get a gut feeling, but I think that you still have to look at facts, um, which I think the facts, or what's usually left over after your gut. So I think it's a bit of both, but you're down, it's down to a judgment call, I think, and recruitment's so hard. You, you, it's hard to get right first time. So what's your, or when you're managing people, what's your tip? I think one, you need to have a base understanding of the, of the, of the person because everyone's different. You can have cultural differences, you, you can have just differences in opinion overall as a person, as an individual, you have to understand that when that person isn't at work, they also go other things that they're dealing with. And, you know, I know in high level corporate roles, they're disregarded a lot. They're like, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm definitely very much the person that would say you've got to show up regardless of how you feel. I, yeah. You do need to put feelings aside. And I think that you do have to learn to perform without motivation. Um, but at the same time, managing people you do have to bear in mind that you have to have an understanding of the person as well now i don't think that 
managing the high level team as in a bunch of drivers, I think that I would be, I'm good at that. Managing a broad set of people, I don't think my skill set lies there. I prefer to have someone else do that. I'm not very good at micromanaging people. I'm probably because there's a breakdown in the communication, I would say from me as in, I expect people to use initiative. And I think that not everybody does. And, and that's even with like virtual assistants, I have a team of virtual assistants and because I expect initiative, yeah. I, that, that, that's a lack of communication from me because I'm expecting it and it doesn't happen. And I'm just like, this is common sense, but it's what's common sense to one person isn't to somebody else. When I first started recruiting here, I had the same issue and property is a complex industry. And when I first started recruiting, I thought, you know, I'll just get admin assistant, uh, who I can teach about property, but then you realise there's so much about property, and half the time I'm thinking, why well, can't you just use simple common sense? If you don't understand something, just Google it. Don't just sit there and wait. Yeah. And um, but after that, that also teaches me that recruitment. Sometimes you just have to recruit specialists, someone who knows about property, so you don't have to number one train them, yeah. or train them as much. And then number two, they just get on with it. And someone who's got experience makes a big difference. And it was a debate we had in the office the other day. Um, about uni and experience but I said look if I went uni I went accounting I did accounting I don't use accounting day to day um, but I know how to look at figures but now if someone comes in front of two people come in front of me both at 21 years old one's got three years experience as an uh, in an accounts job and one's just got an accounting degree who are you recruiting the one with experience every time yeah. um for yeah and and Again, I think it's down to the person that's recruiting because, like yourself, being an entrepreneur, you understand how important experience is. Where I think that things are changing massively. I yeah. think that the fact that, like, the, an example I would use is I don't play tennis, right? But if you give me six months and said, all you need to do is focus on tennis, I, and I watched every YouTube video that I could have the best tennis players, I trained every day. After six months, I'd be a pretty good tennis player, or, yeah. or decent, right? It's the same with any, anything. If you're, if there's no better time now, you can learn and become not expert, but not far off expert level in a very short space of time on a niche if you focus on it. And you can get all the information for pretty much free online if you're disciplined enough to do it. That's the, the problem, is the discipline. So yeah, I think that um, I would always pick experience without a doubt over, over a university degree. Is it motivation or discipline? What, to do something? To do something. Discipline. Why? Because you can be motivated, but motivation doesn't get it, get it done. And you, how, if you always rely on motivation to get something done, then you always consistently got to try and either find something that motivates you or have someone that motivates you. Discipline is when you show up regardless of how you feel, whether you're motivated or not. You, you know something needs to get done and you do it regardless. And I think that the more you take on board external factors and feelings, the less chance you got of get, getting something done because I think self-awareness is important. And I think that we, day to day, we consistently try and BS ourselves in not to doing stuff. We'll always look for justification. So you can look outside and be like, well, I'm, say you want to go running in the morning. It's raining today. I ran yesterday. so." it's okay not to go today, or I've run every day this week. And we do it with everything though, no matter what it is. The gym's the easiest to use as an example because not many people actually like going. But in general, I think we do this to ourselves anyway. So motivation is when you don't want to do something and someone's on tapping you on the back, oh, we can do this, listen to this video, or you, know, you, you motivate the person. But the disciplined person shows up regardless. And I think that's the difference in, in doing something and not doing something because you can do any course you can know all the industry hacks you want all the industry secrets have a great network but if you're not disciplined you're not going to ever get nothing done you have to be willing to get your hands dirty basically when it comes and when you're disciplined like you've got a 5am club whether I want to get up or not I have to get up at 5 o'clock yeah. and it's as simple as that and I think that's with everything um, and you're right I used to think a lot it's about motivation and then now it's like, it's not motivation, because if you're not fired up, are you not going to do it when you have to do something? Yeah. Um, so, so recently we did a 5 a.m. challenge, so where um, it was 21 days and there's a few things you had to do. So 
um, there's a guy called Andrew Huberman, and yeah. I love his podcast, insane. And um, I, I heard on one of his podcasts that you know, 57 minutes in a sauna a week reduces heart disease by like 47%, 11 minutes in cold exposure, um, you know, stimulates blood flow, increases dopamine by like 2.5 times. It was, it was loads of stuff, right? Loads of health benefits. And then on a separate podcast, I heard that somebody say that, you know, about cold water exposure, people would rather have an organ cut out on the operating table than jump in a cold shower. And it made me really think, I'm like, this is actually crazy that, you know, you can, you know, there's so many health benefits and it's just cold water. So we did a 21 day challenge. It was no sugar, 11 minutes in the cold. We missed the sauna out because not everyone had access to a sauna. Um, it was drink three liter, 2.5 or three liters of water a day, wake up at 5 a.m. every day for 21 days. And the purpose of it, of course, there's benefits in all of it, but the main purpose was just to be disciplined. That, can you do 21 days, So all it is, 21 days, and just follow these simple tasks and get them done in 21 days? Most people did it, to be fair, but even the cold water, some people was like, I struggle with cold water. And it's like, well, yeah, no one wants to really jump in like an ice bath, right? But the fact is, it's just, it is just cold water. So when you're looking at it, it's just telling yourself like, all this is is cold water, yeah. it's not gonna kill you. And it's the same with anything, 5 a.m. When the alarm goes off, you, get, you have a decision, you, you know, to sit, be like, am I gonna wake up or am I gonna click snooze? And it's just down to discipline. If, I think that if you can get that instilled in your mind, the amount of benefits you'll have across everything else in life will, will pay off because like we just said, you know, you've got to do stuff you don't want to do regardless, yeah. you know, without someone holding your hand. There's a trick I learned for having a cold shower is you rub, you get a bit of cold water in your hands, just rub it on your body. So you're tricking your mind already that it's going to be cold and then you have the cold shower. Yeah, I haven't tried that, but yeah, I, I can see why it works. But even for, like, for us, for example, as a Muslim, we're going to the fasting month next month. So from dawn to sunset, we're not eating and no eating, no drinking from dawn to sunset. And then from sunset on to dawn, we can eat whatever we want. But it's that discipline for them 12, 13, 15, in June, July, was that 19 hours. You don't eat anything, but you do realize there's health benefits um, and there's mental benefits as well. Definitely, so the, f the fasting for me, I think that, yeah, one is great for discipline, two there's health benefits. So generally, like, before I started looking, going down like, the health rabbit hole, like, I used to think that breakfast was important, Oh, you have to wake up, breakfast, most important meal of the day. Or day. That's how it's been marketed a, yeah. a, across the globe. And, you know, I never have breakfast now, ever. I Why not? Because, again, on Huberman's podcast, one, if you ever want to do a high-focus task, one of the worst things you can do is eat a meal. So when you first wake up, for me to, like, win the day or get the stuff I need to get done, I'm not going to do something that works against me. So if it's not working for me, it's working against me. So, and I've realized that, I, you don't actually need breakfast. So even if you go back in history, like hunter-gatherers and stuff, you know, they don't wake up and think, I need to have my bowl of cereal. One, one, one thing is that mostly everything that's advertised for breakfast is bad for you anyway, because it's just full of sugar. Cereal. Yeah, so why would I do that? Secondly, I, 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 personally, I'm somebody who wakes up, I'll just drink um, as much water as possible, have a coffee and just get on with it. And what I found myself doing when I'm working is I was actually I ended up having one meal a day in the evening. Like you may have a snack, like some fruit or something around lunch, but I started to find myself where I used to be religious. Like I'd be like, right, I'm gonna have breakfast, I'm gonna have a mid-morning meal, I'm gonna have a late, early afternoon meal, one in, try and get like four or five meals a day in. And I cut that down and I realized that I was having one meal in pretty much like early evening and I was okay. And I actually worked more productively. And, I was like, this is crazy that I completely switched it all up and I actually work, it's, it's actually more beneficial for me. I, I, I perform better. How, how did that make you work more productively? Because I stopped caring and thinking about food. Like, I feel that as soon as you're on a lunch break, so if you're in a job or whether you were your own business, yeah. when you think, oh, it's lunchtime, we go looking for food, whether you're, yeah. most of the time when we're hungry, we're actually not hungry. We think we are. And we eat food for entertainment. That's pretty much what we do, and that's what I did. And I still do it now, because I enjoy food. So, you know, I'd eat for entertainment all the time. So if I felt that there's time for food or there's time for a break, I'm like, oh, I need to go and have food. And we actually don't. So the reason why it changed me is because as soon as I stopped thinking of that, it was one less thing I thought, thought about in the day. 
I'd work for longer because I'm more focused because, um, you know, there's all sorts of things. I don't want to get this wrong because I have to fact check it, but you, the choline that goes to the brain that makes you more focused, I think that decreases, I have to fact check it, but decreases it when you eat. So your, foc- your cognitive focus changes. So all of these things, I started to notice that it, w- it wasn't doing me no favors really. So I sort of cut it out and I just felt better. I don't know, which is weird because people say you need to eat food for yeah. energy. It's just, to me, I think it's just BS. I don't, don't think you need to eat food for energy really. There is that, well, a lot of people say breakfast you need, you need to have lunch, the mid-morning snack, fruit or whatever. Yeah. And, um, you need dinner as well, but what I've started to notice because when I went, I went to Zambia, so in, in towards southern Africa in December, everything there was literally off a of farm. The fruit, the vegetables off a of farm. As soon as I come here, I was unwell because the food I'm eating here is all processed, uh, and I think that also has an impact on uh, our energy levels because we're eating injected food, injected crops, or chemicalized crops. Um, which impacts our energy levels negatively. Whereas over there, I was eating three meals a day, probably more than I ate here because I was on holiday. But I only needed four or five hours sleep. I had energy throughout. Uh, we used to go on safari 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning yeah. to try and catch our animals, but we're up and we're energetic. So I think that has another, that's another thing uh, which has an impact. I totally agree. So if you look at on the back of everything in a supermarket, most things have got seed oils in them, right? Seed oils aren't meant really for human consumption. So, but they're in almost everything we eat. Almost everywhere we go out to eat, they cook in seed oils, like sunflower oil, canola oil. All of this stuff's not good for us, right? The reason why when, they say, you go to Zambia and everything's grass-fed, so everything they're eating is grass-fed or it's all natural, right, organic, no wonder you feel better because yeah. it's not processed of all the nonsense and so I order from a company called Piper's Farm and this farm 100% grass fed all their dairy products um, uh, everything's organic everything is is in process no hormones no nothing and since I've been ordering from there I don't know I feel so much better and you know whether it's a placebo or not I don't know but I think that if you if if you do have a placebo effect and it works in your favor then (laughs) do it (laughs) 5d capital partners how did you start that? Why did you start that? Or did you start it? Yeah, I did. So okay. um, initially it was called um, Intralinks. So um, we had a, initially I was trying to buy um, business in the construction sector uh, pretty much on my own. Um, and then when we opened the group, um, like a mastermind group, a lot of people started to get interested in buying businesses. So one of the people in the group or someone I was mentoring, he was like a wizard at um, like lead generation. Um, he had like 60 VAs working for him. So he had a, like a pretty large Amazon business before. So he was very good on the tech side of stuff. And I ended up, he wanted me to come on these like site visits with him to all these different business owners. And I was like, how are you getting so many leads? This is crazy. You know, I'm, I don't know how are you doing it. So he sort of showed me what he was doing. And I was like, look, you know, he said, oh, will you partner me on deals? So I just thought we may as well do this together, you know, because um, he brought a skill set that I didn't have to the table. And then my other business partner is actually my cousin who was out in the States that initially from the construction, so it was plumbing companies, when we was looking at the biotech stuff because of him, we was like, we, you know, we'll do it all under the same sort of company. And then because we sort of, it was a new venture, we kind of was like, look, let's, let's start something new with the three of us that no one else has any ties to. Um, so we started 5D Capital Partners. Obviously, there was three of us, plus any of the sort of networking infrastructure the three of us had, or sort of combined it together. How did he generate so many leads? Because that's a mystery for a lot of people. So he he got like a specific strategy. So he like um, he bolts on like three or four different softwares into one, and it is like a funnel that yeah. these and then. It's all cold outreach, like everything's cold, there's no warm leads. And um, yeah, to the point where if we wanted to take five calls a day with cold outreach with business owners from cold outreach, we could do it. It got to the stage where we had other people that was taking calls for us because he was so busy. And um, we had to turn it off. It was, it, was in, it was incredible. So he's actually in the process now because he was offering it as a service to people. But he's in the process now of just 
basically recording the whole process and he's just going to put it into our group and be like, look guys, if you want to use it, use it because it's just become too much for him to manage because it's wild. <laughs> a business which can generate leads like that, as long as the sales team are doing what they need to do, they'll succeed. Hundred, it's hard, one of the hardest things, yeah. right? The hardest thing for any business, even for us, we're constantly looking at ways. Okay, how can we generate more leads or vendor leads, landlord leads? Or where do we find them? Um, but no, if someone can do that, then that's oh, yeah. for you guys. Well, I always say like, if there's no, if you don't make sales, then nobody's got a job. <laughs> yeah. But if there's no leads, there's no sales. So, yeah, building a customer list is really hard because you know if you haven't got a good brand that people trust in to buy from, it's going to be hard to generate customers. But overall. Just generating leads is one of the sticking points for any business when, it's look, when they're looking to grow. So, yeah, that skill set alone, as you can imagine, I was like, this is insane. Yeah. <laughs> um, what kind of businesses do you look to buy? So now we're predominantly looking at like civils. Um, we, we have bought an e-com space, but we're mainly focused on construction. But like we, before we started, we have a, an estate agents and legals too. So we was very agnostic to start with. But now we're predominantly focused on construction solely because um, we, we want to buy in the same vertical, ideally. But that hasn't really kind of happened. But the good thing is we bought a rendering company um, in South London. So with the civils company, the rendering company, they kind of, there's like new, there's new home developments contracts in both. Plus in the estate agents, there's also development. So yeah. there's, there's some sort of synergy where we can cross sell um, in those areas. Um, and the only other thing that, the only reason we're, this other thing that we're still focused on is because it's been materialising over the past 12 to 15 months. We went out to, because we still looking in the States, last April, I think it was. Yeah, last April we was over in the States visiting various businesses that we've been speaking to. And one of them in particular was in like formulation. So they uh, make supplements, um, they manufacture supplements. And um, we met them. Um, we kind of agreed terms, things changed. We was working with a private equity fund that wanted to acquire them. They had like a nutraceuticals um, arm to their fund. Um, then we was like, look, we'll just take the spread in the middle. We'll agree the deal. Then they decided they didn't want to do that. We're not ready because they offered them like 7X and they're like, oh, we, we want more. I was like, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, and we was going to get compensated nice. So we was trying to get out of the line. Then they changed, and then we've still been talking to them since. And now they're like, oh, we want you guys to come in and help prepare us for PE. So we was like, well, this has changed the goalposts a bit. So we're actually going out on the 3rd of April in a couple of weeks. And this is probably going to be out by the time um, we go. To, um, we're going to spend 14 days in the business, uh, more, more like the consult for equity route. Um, we've already agreed, kind of, what well, we want. Um, and we're going to basically do a kind of a bit of a report on all the things that we think. Like we, we've already got um, an opportunity to probably increase their revenue by like 50% in, in like the first 12 months. Yeah. So we kind of already know the value we can bring. Plus, um, looking at all the back end stuff, like the, the accounting is, is terrible at the moment. Um, so we want to bring the net margin up and just increase their margins overall, but also increase the, 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 the customers too. Why do you look at the, the vertical route when you're looking to buy businesses? Because there's a lot of opportunities to consolidate, centralize different things. So, you know, um, for instance, don't get me wrong, a good example would be, let's say, we bought a civils merchant and we had a civils company. Then, of course, that's going to benefit us because we're going to be looking for materials. So there's a lot of synergy there. Also, you know, you can centralize a lot of one yeah. financials. Um, but then the cross-sell and upsell is important too, I think. Um, when you're looking to exit, because we're not looking to build a group of companies and then just keep them forever. You know, there's, of course, you're buying income and you can generate a lot of good income and get good lifestyle from it. But really, the most money is going to be made upon exit if you buy right and then you build. So we're looking, like Craig, my one business partner, is way more aggressive. Like, I'd like to be aggressive, but for me, I'm like, he's like, 36 months and, we're, and we're, we'll build and sell. And I'm like, I hope so. But I'm just like, if it takes seven years, if it takes 10 years, I don't really care because you know, you're going to really amplify the exit. So I think that um, what people need to understand, especially when people go into m and I feel that everyone's like, I'll just buy all these companies, throw them together and then just sell them to a hedge fund. It's like, 
who, they're not just going to buy anything. Mm. Like, you know, the, these are like serious people, you know, they're serious investors. They're not just going to buy anything. So one, they want to see that there's still growth to be had because they're not going to buy something at the ceiling where it's like, well, I'm just going to pay the most this is ever going to be worth for this now. Like, so they need to know it's growth, but they also need to be like, well, if I'm buying a group, this needs to operate as a group. It has to be optimized as well. Exactly. So if it's not optimized, it doesn't operate as a group, then they know, right, we've got a lot of work to do. We're not really buying a group. We're buying single entities. Yeah. So people like to say, oh, I have a group, but the group needs to operate like a group as well. And like you said, I think we were talking before the cameras are on, but you, you can use um, whether it's staff or whether, whether it's some sort of resource in one that can help yeah. another. That's very important that, you know, and one of the people in the group has just did this now in my mastermind group. He had um, a scaffolding company, roofing company, general construction, and he's just bought a uh, plumbing business. And he basically took one of his um, general managers from the construction company that didn't really have as much to do as he used to do because they've built out more of the infrastructure. He just bought the company. It's like, they need a general manager. You go down there. They said that, what are you struggling with to scale? Oh, we need more vans on the road, more people. He took two of his vans. It just, when you have synergy and when you have the, the resources available, there's so much you can do. And again, when you're looking to exit, all of these things need to be in line. There's no good having four different accountants that are like, well, we don't really know what's going on over yeah. there. Yeah, that, all of that's really important. So we look for all of that. And yeah. But I think when you're looking to purchase a business, the, there's two things you look at. How can we increase the revenue? And then how can we cut costs? And then if you can obviously use a resource from one of your existing businesses to come into here, which cuts costs. Like for example, you don't need four accountants. No. One accountant is good enough. Yeah. Um, or if that means you get a slightly more qualified or more experienced accountant, then you pay them a little bit more, but then you still don't need the other three. No. So we, the account, an accountant firm that we use, we, they, they're kind of, they're not a part of 5D Capital Partners, but they were very, very closely with us. They offer like a remote CFO package. So, for us, it makes sense. It's like having an in-house CFO, but they just don't need to be there. They've got a good team and they do pretty much everything. So I think, yeah, that's really important. But like you said, increased revenue, cutting costs. But I know there's a lot of marketing out there on, like we talked about before, the no money down stuff. Um, and it's not that you can't get good no money down deals. Of course you can. We've done quite a few in the group. Good businesses, right? But in general, when you're looking at good businesses with you know, ideally high margins, high revenue per employee, that's something that I think that most people don't even focus on. Most, like, if you just look at what Elon Musk has done at Twitter, look how many staff yeah, he's, he's got. he's got rid of everyone. Because most of them aren't doing anything. So when you look at revenue per employee, you start to think, wait a minute, uh, you know, because th everyone plays their part. So you're going to have administrators. Um, it doesn't mean that they have to make you, they're making you money because they're part of the team. But, you know, overall, your revenue employee should be fairly high. And, you know, if, if, if you just got people sitting there doing nothing, that doesn't help either. So yeah, good businesses, high margins, high revenue per employee, management structure, um, good infrastructure overall that's already there, already has systems. And one of the, I think, things that people can easily plug into a traditional business is the integration of some sort of tech because many people have done things the same way for a long time and they're scared of change. They've probably got aging management team that aren't willing to try a new system. So yeah, it's not something you come in day one and be like, oh, by the way, out with this, now we're doing this because you don't want to damage the culture. But what you can do is you can slowly integrate some sort of tech to, to automate a lot of the business and just make more efficient systems and just make everything more efficient overall. Would you rather purchase a company for one pound, a distressed company for one pound, or a company with good systems and ready to scale? The one that good systems ready to scale, is this EBITDA positive or is this... No, it's positive. It's oh, profit-making, yeah. straight away. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> like, unless you've got like a specialized, specialist skill set as like a turnaround specialist or you, you know how to solve the issues in a distressed business, you, you're buying yourself a job that's going to be... It's a very tough job because it... Yeah. So if you want to buy a business and you don't want to be the actual operator, then you don't want to buy a distressed business. <laughs> Some people want to buy, or some people glorify, you can buy a business for one pound. Why do you not necessarily disagree with it, but why would you generally advise against it? So yeah, so I don't disagree with it. I think that it serves its purpose when needed. So I think that if you have a good platform business or a group, 
and you see a company that may be running out of cash in the next 60 or 90 days and you know that you can bring that into your ecosystem you have now more customers and you can suck up a lot of the things that are going wrong and you know you can solve the problems and basically increase your revenue then i think that's the way it should be done personally or unless you have a skill set in it now i think that there's a lot of misconceptions around the one pound deal um, and how hard it can be but i think it needs to be done right so if you're buying a business that's already good even if you have to put some money into it so you can still do no money down deals but let's say you have to put a bit of money in to buy a good business why would you not want to buy something that's already cash make it's got good cash flow day one already operates with or without you there day one you know you can add some sort of value from whether you have the skill set or not or bring somebody in you can add some sort of value to the business that's already making money or have a business that's running out of cash in 60 or 90 days and you don't have a clue how to change that like that requires like i said a specialist skill set now there's some cool things you can do where there's a strategy you can do called invoicing out where you can um you know get the initial company you can put that into insolvency and then you can pull the assets including the staff out into um, a new spv you can you know create an invoice for probably 50 percent of the net asset value on the balance sheet depends on the ip yeah. value it, it all depends like if, if, if they got vans in the company they can just go on auto trader and be like that's the fair market value and you can't argue with it but fixtures and fit-ins and stuff you know what what is the fire sale value of that so you can generally get a pretty good deal on that 90 or 120 day invoice and then you get a trade the new spv with no debt for 90 or 120 days and you know then you could end up with a good company if, if you know what to do now of course it's going to be some probably a slight bit of damage to the culture because you're going for a debt restructure but you know in general you can do it and an example of this is uh, we didn't get it in time but a friend of mine was from the states he bought a business in the uk with a uk investor he kind of left the UK, another, another example of a bad JV, left the UK investor to his own devices. He started taking on additional loan facilities and his lifestyle was a little bit, getting a little bit too much for the business to handle. And this company was doing about 100K a month in revenue and net margin was like 30%-ish. So it's, it's good business, right? But you can imagine how bad this person was running it. To, that was going to run out of uh, money in like 30 days, right? Um, he told me this after he was already in insolvency, he was too far gone. Now, in that example, you, let's say the assets, like conservatively, I don't know, 100K on the balance sheet. Imagine creating a 50K 90 day invoice in that scenario. You're going to earn, say, 90K over that 90 days. Yeah. And then you're 40K up, plus you've got a business that's doing seven figures a year in sales and 30% margin. So, in that case, perfect case scenario would be oh, I've managed to acquire a good business for a pound here. and minus and plus the 50 day uh, sorry 90 day invoice that you have to pay you know then that's good it doesn't always work like that but in general you can do that and there's many out there like you can go on like right biz now and there's distressed businesses doing like 20 million a year in sales but and you can look at them your eyes light up and be like well i can buy a business doing 20 mil it's like yeah but you know t the working capital <laughs> to run that business when you take over it you pro unless you've got probably seven figures in working capital then and you've got to risk it because you don't know if you can turn it around. So, you know, of course, online, people glamorize everything that usually goes right or why you should do this strategy because this is what you can do, which I think is important to know the power of it. But on the flip side, you also need to be aware of, you know, the realism and, and, and understand the downside risk um, of it as well. When you buy a business, are there always unknowns regardless of how much due diligence you do? Are they always what, sorry? Unknowns. Is it? As in, are there always things that you are unsure of, even though you do a lot of due diligence? So for us, we'll do as much as we can. So we've got like a bit of a technique where what we found was deals are going into legals and then falling out of bed because things weren't, we didn't get enough information at the start. So we just created a, like a pre-due diligence checklist between our accountant and law lawyers and was like, tell me what you need for this to even go into legals rather than you chasing them for these things. So to mitigate the risk of it falling out of bed. So we do a lot of that first. Now there's going to be some unknowns that you, you know, actual relationships with clients, you know, at a high level, maybe they do more due diligence on this. We so, only so much you can do without, you don't want to rattle the cage either. Right. So um, some of those, you don't know how deep rooted they are with 
in regards to personal relationships, you don't know what favours have been done. You don't know what favours have been done inside the business for certain employees so they get prefer preferential treatment. Um, there's going to be certain things you are unknown and you're going to find out post-acquisition. So the first 90 days is key. And I think that the less you do in the first 90 days in regards to change is probably the better because you want to go for a process of understanding the business actually when you're in it. So yeah, there's some unknowns. Have you ever bought a business and it's like, this is a minefield, wish I hadn't bought it? Yeah, we're going for a situation now. Could you but, shed more light? Um, yeah, so we bought a business that um, was very automated in a sector I wouldn't typically buy one in. And when we do our due diligence, speaking to the previous um, sellers, they're like, we don't really do anything, it's all automated. When we started to understand <laughs> the way they run the business, it was a shambles as far as I'm concerned. The automations wasn't great. They put it this way, the touch points for a customer to buy the product was like 42. It was ridiculous. Mike, my business partner, the one that's good at automation, brought that down to less than 10. And we had to literally, so, so I contradicted myself now. When I say don't do nothing in the first 90 days, make the changes, we had no choice. We was like, this, can't, this business can't operate like this. I'm surprised it does now. So it was a case of, this is the way we've always done it, so we'll keep doing it that way. So yeah, so that was a minefield, unraveling a lot of stuff. We also, the year that we bought the business, um, they wanted to take as much as they could out the business. We, so they was just basically showed no profit the year we bought it. Um, but then they took technically, technically an illegal dividend because they took a dividend when the company showed no profit. So go into the director's loan account, they're like, I'll just write it off. And I'm like, no. I'm like, because, yeah, technically we bought the business. Yeah, you could write it off, right? But if the HMRC comes knocking on the door yes. and they're like, you haven't made tax on this, they're like, oh no, our, our accountant said write it off. I'm like, I don't really care what your accountant says because, you know, if you could just do that every year, everyone would do it. Yeah. Oh, I'll just take 300 grand at the company and just scrap, it doesn't work like that. So I'm like, either, you know, because there was some deferred payments, I'm like, either we're going to hold those deferred payments back for that figure and then, you know, let's wait six years. And they're like, oh, we can't wait six years. We agreed this. I'm like, yeah, but we didn't agree that you take that either. So, you know, you either put the money back in and we'll, we'll come to another agreement or we'll hold the money for six years on the deferred pay. So, yeah, things can happen because even when the SPAs are drawn up and all the DDs concluded, there's still some things that can pop up after and you do have to be careful. What's the biggest challenge you've had in running any business? So, well, running any business, um, I think, so I've never, I've only ever experienced our class burnout once. So I, I believe that a lot of the times, and this is, pers like, it depends on the person, so I don't want to like make anyone feel that's listened to this like, you know, I'm speaking down on it, but I think that a lot of the times people experience burnout, they're not actually experiencing burnout. And I think a lot of it's down to mindset but I actually once, the only time I experienced it, and it's because I didn't feel burned out, it's because of what happened. So when I was building, um, it was a meal prep company, so it was like, basically, we, our slogan was fit fast food. So we was kind of like, we see like Leon and all these companies sort of doing now. And there's a company in London called Protein House that I love their business model. Th their food wasn't great, but I love their business model. Is it the house with the H-A-U-S? Yeah. So yeah. I like their shakes. I didn't like their food. It was a bit bland. But, and then Kettlebell Kitchen, I think it was called in Manchester. Um, I've got her name, but she, yeah. So she did a great job too up there. Um, and I was like, I like their marketing and the way their food looks because they're, they're making it look like your everyday food, but I like Protein House's approach. So we've tried to get a mix of both and improve ours. And that's a bit of a background of what, what the business was. And then what we, we had, we were doing 1,500 to 1,700 meals a week on meal prep. Um, and then we had an opportunity to take on a location in um, St. David's um, Centre in Cardiff. It's like the biggest shopping centre in Wales, pretty much. Um, and then we, Landsec, that was sort of the landlord, we were speaking. Um, we were speaking to them about you know scaling this across the UK, and they're like, look, we got 16 shopping centres. So they said the next one you can have is um, Blue Water um, in London, and then the other one was Trinity in Leeds, and then we'll go from there. So we had like this great plan to scale, um, and because I was finding it hard 
to one, we had a, obviously a, a ki- an off-site kitchen and it was very hard to get staff. I mean, it, our turnover staff was crazy. And even on the kiosk, it was turnover staff was hard. Is that because of the nature of the industry? I think so. At the time, it was my first time in that industry. So I didn't think, I was just like, it can't be that hard. Yeah. You know, we'll get it done. And I was a big eye opener. I found that very hard. Um, then we start, we actually got a decent team in the kitchen and because we had some legal issues, I can't speak on all of it, but one of the directors did things they shouldn't have done, didn't hold up to their responsibilities, and the business suffered because of it. And yeah, it, things started to go downhill very, very quickly. Um, you know, it, was, it would cost quite a bit to run the company, you know, and our, our model was like, look, if we don't turn a profit in the first year or two, it is what it is. We know that on scale, we, this can be pretty big. And we had obviously the, the support of Landsec, which we needed the, the locations, right? And I was like, this is perfect. They, they, were, they were on board with this completely. Um, and I remember because of staff, we struggled. I remember I found myself working on the kiosk way more than I'd like to. Like my wife was pregnant at the time. She was doing shifts because she had a retail background years ago. Um, she actually did a lot of good there. She put, started putting some systems in and some processes in that, we didn't have and I'm like wow I'm glad you <laughs> come on here and we we found and then I remember the one day I was I went to the kitchen like early doors to make sure that they was ready for the day I went down to the kiosk plus everything else that was going on and we had like this university um event in the shopping center which like everyone opened up give them discount and then I worked on through that whole thing trying to build relationships with local gyms and stuff I remember coming home and my mum was looking after the children, right? The other two children. And I came to her house at like super late. Like the thing didn't finish till like 10. I got home at like 11 and I was like, went to pick the kids up. I just woke up like, I think I woke up like early hours. I fell asleep on the floor in her living room. And I was like, what? I, and they're just like, we wanted to let you sleep because like, I think we, you needed sleep. And that's the only time I can actually, I felt I must have burned out because I actually can't remember going to sleep. So, um, yeah, I think that that's probably the most difficult time because it wasn't long after that where just when I thought like, oh, okay, I understand now, I need to, we need to hire more people and we need to grow it this way. We had an, out, an exterior consultant say that they was going to help um, because of the issues that we were facing. And then I found out some things that one of the directors was doing and then it all kind of fell on me because I was the most invested financially in the business. I was the only invested. I, I basically put everything in. So I was like, wow, this is, um, this is all going to come down. And it was like one of those ideas where it's like this was destined for greatness. And again, people. If you don't have the right people, it's hard to scale. So did you then take a step back to manage your bet now? Or... Do I step, take a step back now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of my favorite books is Who Not How. I definitely take the Who Not How approach to pretty much everything now. I was, I was very like a control freak back then, where now I'm just like, who can do that? If something comes to me, unless it's actually like the architecture of a deal, like I'm very much hands-on, because you need to know, again, self-awareness, know what you're good at and know what you're not good at. Like admin and anything that I know should be outsourced, I will do it if I, if I can. But do you, do you recognize now that because you were mentioning self-awareness, so do you recognise that I might be getting burnt out soon, I'm getting a bit more lethargic or fatigued, and then try to do something else? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, now, I'm very much in tune as well with, like, I'm really, I'm all about, like, optimal performance, so I, I'm, I make sure I am aware of how I feel, and there's some days where you're not going to feel like, so, you know, there's, there's supplements you can take, like this Alpha GPC, help sends choline, more choline to the brain like we talked about earlier. You know, those sorts of things, if I feel like, right, I've got to get this done, again, down to discipline, then I'll be like, right, what can I do? I'll get some more coffee in me. I, I, whatever I need, I'll do it. But then at the same time, if, if you don't feel up to it, if you've got to do it, do it. But, you know, you also need to be aware of that time when if you don't want to do it. But uh, this, this is a really funny topic for me with work-life balance. I, and I talk about it a lot with people. I'm not really a big fan of it, personally, um, just because I enjoy work. How many hours do you work a week? As many as I can. So what does happiness look like to you now? Is it just doing what you want, when you want? 
yeah, just wake up and just do what you want, really. Um, I'm not like fully there yet, really, but I'd pretty much, I've, I'm quite flexible. But the thing that really makes you happy more than anything is my kids. So like making them happy and seeing them happy. So if I had to break everything down, that's what would be it. But what I enjoy doing, yeah, I enjoy sport, I enjoy travel, but I actually like work. So when people say, oh, work-life balance, take days off, like, yeah, if I want to take days off, I just do it. I, I, I don't set that out. I'm just, because yeah. an example I use usually is, like, let's say people go, why don't you go down to the pub with your friends and watch football or whatever, right? Like, what would I prefer to do? Like, actually, what would I prefer to do? Would I prefer to work or do that? Personally, I prefer to work. That's personally me. So what would be the point in me going to do something that makes me less happy for work-life balance? That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think that, yeah, everyone's different, though. Everyone operates differently. Um, I go through stages where sometimes I'm like, I want more time where I just enjoy myself if I travel, and then I'll just do it. I, just, I don't like be like, Saturday, Sunday, I'm not working. I just do whatever. I think, just like you said, everyone's wired differently. And if some people want to do that nine to five, because that makes them happy, and that they can take care of their kids or their family, and they're happy with that, that's up to them. Or if someone wants to work seven days a week and build a legacy or build an empire, or work towards a goal that they want to achieve in ten years, and again, that's up to them. But then how they deal with it, I think that's what comes down to mindset and discipline, like we were mentioning earlier. And then again, you need this comes to self awareness. You need to know what you're good at. So if you're working 10-hour days and you realise, you know what, I'm not productive like that, I'd rather split them up in five hours and then five hours in the evening, again, it's down to each individual. It's crazy, right? There's, they did a study in the States on self-awareness and they asked this group of people, do they believe they're self-aware? And like 95% of them said they were. When they actually conducted the study, 85% of them lacked self-awareness. So that shows how many people are completely wrong about th how aware they actually are of themselves. And when you actually think of it, most people aren't aware. It's not because they're not, they don't generally have natural common sense. Because in hindsight, common sense looks like, oh, that, that was obvious. But and, <laughs> hindsight bias, right? But um, most people look for confirmation bias. And that's in life. We, we go through life and we're, we have a bit of cognitive dissonance on the things that we want. And you know, if, for instance, if you was to go and invest in property and the market's rolling over, if you're in, already invested in it, the last thing you want to hear or see is anything that says the market's going to roll over. Yeah. So you naturally look for things that confirm with what you want. And it's, 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 the, it's the same as the opposite. And, and we do that with everything, though, whether it's investments, whether it's relationships, whatever it is, we naturally look for the thing. And the problem we have today is if you look at your phone, that's what your phone shows you. Like the algorithms yeah. will show you the things that you like. So they show you more of what you like. So whatever your opinion is, that opinion is only going to get stronger and stronger because you only see the things that you like. So you, have, you, have, you really need to make a conscious effort, I think, now more than ever in challenging the opposite opinion. So if something, you want something so bad, go and watch and research all the things that say that thing is not going to happen and then make your mind up on it because I think that's important. It's like when you're watching football and a referee, there's a referee's decision that you disagree with. You're <laughs> going to look for every, everyone who agrees with you and disagrees with the referee. Exactly. Um, and it's that validation people look for. Oh, yeah. That, that's, that's a big issue, I think. That's one of the main issues is that we just try and justify to ourselves why we should do something or why we shouldn't do something or whatever the reason may be, we look for justification and we're very good and making those excuses or putting that point across to yourself because the play is over in our own mind. How did you build self, or how did you build self awareness? Um, I don't know actually know how it came around because I think that just becoming more mature and getting older, I started to realize some of the decisions that I used to make because it's very hard to. Um, make a decision today based on how you're going to feel in five or ten years. Yeah. That's so hard to do. And I started to realize some of the decisions that I made like five or ten years ago, I'm like, I would literally, why did I make that? You know, when you look, look back and I think, I can't actually believe that I made that decision or I can't believe that was my opinion back then. Or, and I don't know, I think that being aware of what some of the things that I made, decisions I made back then, I started to realize that Wow, you, you really need to start challenging your opinion. I started to do it more than ever in like 2019 because 
mainly because of crypto, right? So I started to go right down the crypto rabbit hole. So 2017, I was, I was like researching it, but I couldn't really find like a use case for anything. I was just like this bit of a Ponzi, you know, but whatever. And then when I started to like dive deep into more of the banking system from 2017 onwards and becoming a bit of a historian of money and everything, then I started to be like, okay, I started to understand the use case slightly of this now. And then, then I found myself watching a lot of videos to confirm my opinion on, say, Bitcoin. So I literally went on YouTube and said, typed in, Bitcoin's going to zero. And I, there's a guy, it's about an hour and 20 minutes. So I watched like 25 minutes of it. And I could feel myself getting angry at his opinion. And I thought, this is the problem. This is like, I'm getting angry because I want him to say something else. And he's saying the thing I don't want him to say. And I thought, this is why you need to do more more than anything challenge your opinion and just because you want something to happen doesn't mean it's right and then it, it, it gives you the real outcome of what you really think if you take it on board and challenge your opinion and yeah take that other opinion on board you start to realize okay was i right was i wrong where uh, most of it's just yeah you don't know if you're right or wrong it's his opinion but you start to like gain a more solid opinion i think um when you challenge the opposite and when you listen to something you don't want to listen to so what advice would you give to 18 year old d um, first of all, sort your environment out. That's number one. You know, the, I know it sounds a bit, you know, when people say, oh, the top five people around you, but it's true. Like, the top five people around you, you know, if you hang around with five professional football players, there's a good chance you may become the fifth or you can become pretty good at football at least. If you f hang around with five people, I don't know, that are selling drugs, you're probably going to become the fifth or you're going to be around it at least. So I think environment's number one. Um, and you have, you, the, the mad thing is you, you have a choice. You actually get to choose who your environment is. You get to choose who you pick the phone up to, who you hang around with, who you follow on social media, what you see on your timeline. We actually get a choice, it's just down to discipline. So I would say first and foremost, environment, um, and pick one thing that is gonna get you to your your goal or whatever it is you want it, your desired outcome to be and just double down on it, tunnel vision, forget everything else and do it. Because, you know, there's, there's like these three steps that I, I wanna, I'm gonna go through with my kids. The eight year old's not far off, but when she's a little bit older, um, what's your desired outcome, number one? If that desired outcome is Lamborghinis, Ferraris, yachts and private jets, then I say, okay, step two is what career or job do you want? If, if number two doesn't align with number one, you're already wasting your time. Because yeah. number step three is the data. Like, look at the data. And if the data for two and one don't align, it's, it's pointless, right? And looking back for me, that, that's, if I wish I was asked those questions then, because when I'm 18, if you're an 18-year-old now, this is exactly what you'd be asking yourself. Because my ambition and my goal when I was like 14, 15 years old was I wanted supercars, yachts, jets, overseas villas that's what I wanted but because I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time yeah I was washing dishes and gardening and stuff and but the thing the only thing in school when I had to pick my subjects in like year nine the only lesson I actually enjoyed and the teacher I liked was my PE teacher because I liked sport so the only thing I thought oh I have to choose now I want where I want to be that's what they tell you right yeah. so I want to be a PE teacher but now that doesn't match <laughs> so back then I didn't even think about this yeah. this formula I, I literally looking back I'm like wow like even if I took put in the ceiling that I could earn as a PE teacher in say London the highest earning city in the UK they just don't even align it doesn't even make sense yeah you know even, even if I th th I know what the ceiling is right the 54k is the ceiling for a PE teacher in London right um based on like in, data on the on Glassdoor so I'm like, even if I didn't work as a PE teacher and I had the 54K, it still doesn't, make, still doesn't make sense. So I'm like, even if I didn't go to work and had the money, it doesn't make sense. So if I could go back, and this is exactly what I'm going to be telling my kids, is you know, when you want to choose what you want to be, forget what it is you want to be for now. I don't know, I'm not saying money's everything because there are more important things than money. But I'm saying, what do you want your life to look like? I would say there's a very, very high probability that you need money for that life, even if it's very basic and content. Yeah. What do you want to do? How do you want your life to look? And now let's have a look at what career you're going to choose. That's what I would say to 18 year old D. And um, how many businesses do you run? About, I think, seven or eight at the moment. 
what advice would you give to a businessman or entrepreneur who's running multiple businesses? You need a good team. That's number one. Like, you, you need a quite diverse skill set. You need to be very resilient as an individual. Mindset's very important because you're probably going to have more down days and ups. Yeah. But you don't want to become a firefighter. That, so I think team's important. And um, yeah, the quicker you learn that there's someone else way better than you at doing something, the better. Because as an entrepreneur, when you first start out, we got a big ego and we think that no one else can do anything. So I think that the quicker you learn that there's always going to be someone better than you and the quicker you hire that person, the, better, the easier it is going to be for you. It's about putting people in the right positions, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, just before we finish, a quick fire round. Uh, favourite food? Steak. Uh, which part of the steak? Any? Fillet tail. <laughs> uh, favourite holiday destination? For um, actual holiday and enjoying myself, Dubai, but for peace and quiet, Thailand. Uh, you've worked in Dubai as well, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, favourite movie? Ah, um, I don't really have like, a favourite movie. I like all the Denzel Washington films. Um, yeah, probably a Denzel film, I just, <laughs> it's hard to pick. Favourite book? The McKinsey Way. I've not read that. Who's the author? Are you asking? It's an incredible book. It breaks down their MISI and their, their framework. So um, obviously the number one management consultant firm in the world, them and Bain, and it breaks down the, the entire MISI framework. And I think that any business owner, like that book is so beneficial for you to understand and identify problems. And then they create an issue tree of how, all the, how you solve the problems and how to get to the root cause of it and how to build off it. Incredible, but That's yeah, good. it's a good book. Uh, favorite day? Favorite day? Monday. Yes. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve, for coming yeah, on. Yeah, I appreciate uh, it. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, that's okay, man. Cool.